So this video is a podcast interview with MTV reality winner and actor, Eddie McGee. Are you listening? So this video is a podcast interview with reality winner and actor, Eddie McGee. He won the first American season of Big Brother, scoring a half of a million dollars and propelling him to instant fame. And I was super excited to recently sit down with him on this podcast. If you're new to my channel, do consider subscribing and hitting the bell icon because I do vlogs, but also interviews like this one on this channel, interviewing some of the most fascinating people that I can find. This includes people that have come into sudden wealth and sudden fame because one of the things about me, I actually won the lottery in 1999 uh, before going back to college to study film and journalism and broadcast news. And I'm now combining my experience with these things with my desire to meet and interview other people that I find fascinating. And Eddie McGee is one of those people. And so if you are new to my channel, do consider subscribing and hitting the bell icon. But this video is a podcast interview with reality winner of the MTV first American season of Big Brother. So Eddie actually won this series that was the first of many continued seasons of this very successful reality show. And so I got to talk to him about what it was like to be in the house and just what it was like to be on the show. But also, he is an actor and he's gone on to do some movies and quite a few things that are very, very interesting. So without further ado, let's get to it now. Here is my podcast interview with reality winner and actor, Eddie McGee. So I'm here with Eddie McGee. Eddie, how are you today? Good, yourself, man? Yeah, not too bad. Thank you so much for joining me um these are these are crazy thanks times. for having me and give me a, yeah thanks for having me give me re give me a reason to comb my hair i haven't combed my hair in like i don't know five weeks so yeah thank you i combed my hair appreciate it thank you and i actually put on a belt and pants so thanks i appreciate that Sam. Yeah. thank you yeah right yeah i think we're all i think we're all gonna have very very bad haircuts here shortly uh, but no you look good yeah. you look good um, thank you yeah so I really appreciate you joining. We we met a few years ago in 2012 with one of your films uh, that yeah. you, you starred in. And I definitely want to talk about that. But first of all, for, for people that don't know you yet, or you know some people that may be watching that aren't familiar with, with your career and your path, um, how did you get into acting? And in the intro, I mentioned that you basically you won the first season, American season of Big Brother and yeah. you you know you've done quite a few things that are very notable but can you get into your backstory a little bit how did you get into sure into this type of thing sure 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 um so i uh, i grew up uh, uh here on long island uh in new york i uh, lost my left leg to cancer when i was 11 it was a uh, bone cancer found in my left knee and it spread up to about mid thigh and to keep it going the rest of my body and killing me they wound up amputating the leg at high thigh um, I had wanted to be an actor since I was about five or six years old. So I lost my leg. Those dreams and aspirations went out the window. There was nobody in mainstream film or television that I could look up and aspire to be. Um, if you're African-American or if you're a Latino or gay or lesbian, there's somebody in film and television that you can look up to, aspire to be and say, oh, I can be like that person. There's somebody you can identify with. But me being disabled, there, there's no guy with one arm or a guy in a wheelchair or a, a girl who's, uh, you know, uh, no, there's no mainstream disabled actors or players in television and film. So I kind of just pushed that away and said, OK, fine, okay, fine, I'll just I'll deal with it. Um, and I started playing wheelchair basketball when I was about 13 or so and did did well at it, actually. Uh, uh, got, to re got to represent the USA a little bit here and there. I got a full scholarship to school for it. Played, played pro in Europe. Um, but I got a full scholarship to the University of Texas in Arlington where I was a broadcasting major and I took theater as a minor. So originally what I was going to do is that if I couldn't be an actor, I was going to get my broadcasting degree in Texas and then come back to Long Island and hope to get a job at one of the local radio shows. You know, how terrible of a life would that be to listen to in the ACDC and tell you about traffic on the Long Island Expressway and call it a life. It wouldn't be terrible. So I was going to, you know, it's going to hopefully be a disc jockey. Then while I was at school, a buddy of mine was a film major and he's like, hey, look, I need an actor for a few shorts I need to do for my senior in your thesis. Can you help me out? I said, sure. Yeah, I'd love to. So I did a few short films in college and then on a dare in college, I wound up going out for the first season of Big Brother. So 
Wow. So what was the what was the dare? What was that like? Well, what it was was it was more along the lines of the my so on my wheelchair basketball team there were guys from all over the world with all different all all ranges of disabilities and here I was this you know 19 20 year old punk New York kid you know drove up an 84 Ford Camaro and would wreck all right waste all of his money on beers on the weekends and I was you know I was just a, I was a bit of a madman so my buddies my buddies I was playing basketball with were like Eddie you know you need to go out for, out for that show the real, real, real world and I was like the real world yeah you on the real world on MTV would be super cool because you're not the typical what people think of when they park you know when they see a handicap sign in a parking lot but you know, we are people too you know we're we're boyfriends and we're bar fighters and you know we're mechanics and you know we're we're regular people you should go out for real world and give us a voice so I said, uh, shit, I got nothing to lose. Why not? But the, uh, the auditioning process for Real World was in August that year. It was in August of 2000. And a friend of mine uh, said, look, why don't you go out for this other show, Big Brother? But at the end, if you make it's $500,000. So I said, all right, well, I'll go ahead and audition for this Big Brother thing. Try to hone in on what works, what doesn't work. And then I'll be tuned up and ready to go for the August auditioning for Real World. And so I went to CBS and got the application for Big Brother and applied. Hmm. And when you apply for a show like that, what exactly do you do? I read that there's a huge questionnaire. And what's the, the process of getting on a show like that? Uh, well, I kind of I kind of botched it up when I did it, but it worked out for the best. I, uh, I went down to the CBS station uh, in Dallas or Fort Worth. I can't remember. I was going to school in Arlington. So I went down to, I think it was the Fort Worth CBS station. And I went by and I picked up, a hand picked up a packet there at the station and left. And it was, it was, it was, it was, it was an okay size questionnaire. I mean, it was like maybe 50 questions, 60 questions. So like 25 were personal names, social security, address, phone number, blah, blah, blah. And the next 25 or 30 were creative. Describe your perfect day. What's your perfect mate like? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Blah, blah, blah. So I wasn't very eclectic or, uh, you know, cool back then. So I just I called like 10 people I knew. They were a very, very uh, diverse group. It was like an 18 year old punk rocker I knew from Toronto to uh, to a 35 year old single mom career, you know, career woman. And I called all these people over to my place, got a couple of beers, got some pizzas. And I went around the room. I was like, where do you see yourself in 10 years? And I'd ask somebody and they would go ahead and tell me and I just ran write it down and what's your perfect mate like and they tell me and i'd write it down and just went around the room we had some fun it was a goof next day i go back to the cbs station i go to hand it in and as i go to hand it in there's a lady behind the desk she's like great where's your tape I go, tape and it says yeah it must include a two minute tape describing why you believe you belong on the show and i was like shit lady look i i don't have a vhs camera i'm a broke college kid i said this is all i got she goes i got one i got one in the back if you want to if you want to go ahead and lay one down real quick and i was thinking to myself this is either how a porno or a horror movie starts but the hell with it i'm in <laughs> so i i go i go in the back room with her and she throws in a brand new tape and little red light comes on and I used about 10 seconds of the time. I said, how you doing, guys? My name's Eddie. I'm going to school here in Texas. I'm from New York. Lost my leg to cancer as a kid. Playing basketball on a scholarship. Now, if you want to know anything more about me, come find me. Now, turn the f camera off. She's like, what? I said, you heard me. Turn the f camera off. <laughs> she turns it off. I go, ma'am, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It was just, it was an angle. It was a, it was a thing. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean anything by it. She goes, no, that's a great approach, kid. I think that's fantastic. That'll definitely perk their ears up. I wish good luck. Good luck. Luck, I think. Okay. She sent stuff. I got a phone call two weeks later from CBS. Flew me out to LA. Did some more testing with them and executives and blah blah blah, psychologists and doctors and so it was like me and like thirty or forty, or 40 other people that they were eyeballing and yeah. So wow, it's kind of the gist of it. Yeah, it was a long time ago. It was twenty years summer. Man, it was a long time ago. Wow, that's that's yeah, that's hard to believe. So when what did it feel like when you? when you were selected to be on the show? Was it was great. I mean, it was, it, uh, my, my, you know, my brain was just racing that this is fantastic. I'm, I have a one in 10 chance at half a million dollars. Those are better odds than anybody ever I've ever heard of. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it was, it was great. It was just, that was phenomenal. I mean, never mind being on the, you know, the TV aspect of it. I don't give a shit about any of that, but having a one in 10 chance at 500 K 
that doesn't suck. That'll make anybody jump for joy. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's way better than uh, most things. Way better than the lottery. You know, I think you have a better chance of uh, being killed by a <laughs> by a asteroid or a meteorite than than that of winning the lottery. But one in ten is <laughs> awesome. Uh, not bad. I'll take those odds. Yeah. Did you feel like you were going to win, or did you feel, or you just felt like uh, you had a chance? Yeah, I I felt uh, I felt going into the house. Uh, I felt going into the house that if I didn't get kicked out right away, I'd have I'd I'd win. It was I was kind of cocky. I was a twenty one year old snot nosed kid. I was pretty cocky. Um, yeah, I, when you see, again, I was a, I was a broadcasting major at school and I knew CBS, I knew the demographics of CBS and CBS's demographics are generally older. Mm -hmm. So if you want to say this was a strategy, then it was like the first strategy implemented was I was going to automatically gravitate to the two oldest, the oldest male and the oldest female. And then the one wild card providing that I wasn't it and I wasn't. So that was good. So I gravitated to two oldest male and female and the one wild card, which is my friend still to this day, Brit. And uh, I said, well, if I kind of play my card somewhat right, I should be in the top five, which is not bad. And then I'll go ahead and battle it out from there. So I kind of I kind of implemented that as, a, as an idea and a strategy of base to go by. And another another thought process I had, which kind of worked, I seemed like an for doing it, but it worked. When I went in, you know, everybody was jockeying for position like, oh, I'm going to cook. Oh, I'm going to clean. Oh, I'll take care of the pool. Oh, I'll take care of the chickens. And I said, I ain't going to do that. Because if you start out down here, <laughs> you can only go up. So if you start out doing everything, being a superhero, and you get burnt out, you're an if you start out as a you can only get better. <laughs> so as people started, I started picking up their job more and more and more and evolving as a person. Uh, so yeah, so I kind of, it was kind of a strategy, if you will, a, a attack that I use. So, yeah, no, that's, that's, and again, this was 20 years ago. This is 20 years ago when none of this was even out. Like there were no alliances. There were no backstabbing. I was just a straight up about it. I mean, I said, look, I'm not here to make friends. I'm 21 years old. I have better things to do with my summer than be locked up in a house with no newspaper, no phone, no internet, no TV, no radio. I got better things to do. I'm not here to make friends. If you get in the way between me and $500,000, I will cut you. So, <laughs> well, that, yeah, that, wasn't that, very nice. <laughs> wasn't very nice. Oh, that sounds like a smart strategy. So what, you know, when you were... Work. What, yeah, you know, it did. And, and I know this was 20 years ago, but congratulations again. It's still awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So when, when, you, when, when you were competing with these people, what was the... Was sure. it stressful or, you know, what was the overall feel like, you know, when you, on your day-to-day -day basis? It really, it wasn't, it wasn't stressful. It wasn't, you know, we weren't button heads and, and we weren't in the trenches fighting against each other. It was none of that. Mm -hmm. It was more, um, more of a mindset as time went on. It was us against, us against them. You know? so we knew that putting each other up to get kicked out was part of the taxes that we had to stay there in the house. You know what I'm saying? It's part of the job, part of the shit that we had to do. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was more of a mentality of us against them, us against, you know, Big Brother, against the network, against the show, the studio, whatever the hell we were doing, whatever our brain set was at that point. Um, so, no, that wasn't that wasn't stressful. I'm, I don't know what today's shows are like. I've never seen one. I never even saw mine. Never mind the shows today. Um, but uh, but, yeah, no, it wasn't it wasn't a big deal. It just I, I know that. There, I think there were like 12 or 13 chopping block, like 13 rounds that get kicked out of the house. Mm. And if there were 13 of them, I was up for like 11. You know, I was up for the first two. I didn't, I wasn't up to get kicked out. But after that, I was up to get kicked out every round after every week. I had to pack my <laughs> to kick out. And every day they said somebody else other than me. And I went back and I packed my. <laughs> so, um, and, yeah. And to Anyways. Get, yeah. So. And, and for the people that, the people that haven't watched that show, how do how do you get kicked out? So my show was the first show that... So Endemol is the production company that brought it over from the Netherlands. It was a huge, huge success in the Netherlands and then spread through Europe and then came over to the States. And so the very first year, uh, the format was we in the house would jump into a room and nominate two people to be put up on the chopping block to get kicked out. Uh, but unlike the show's format, formats today and a lot of a lot of other shows is nowadays they internally 
uh, kick them out. Where on my show and my show only, there was a 900 number set up where it was a dollar, dollar fifty or something to call in, and the audience got to play God. They say who stays and who goes. So I so I knew I didn't have to win the love of everybody in the house and backstab and love this one and cheat on that one and I just had to make sure the viewers liked me and most of them did I think yeah I think most of them did and obviously they think is I won but um yeah so I I kind of knew that and I was like again look I'm not here to be friends with you I'm here to take this money back and I think. I think that, you know, the viewers, whether they liked me or not, I think they respected the fact that I was there to win money, to take it home to my family. Yeah. And I think that that that's what helped me in the end. <laughs> and and when, so. you, yeah, and when you actually did win, how did that feel? It was great. I mean, 21 years old, yeah. you know, um, yeah. CBS cutting you a check for five hundred thousand dollars didn't suck man it was great i mean it was phenomenal it was yeah that's awesome so it was a great great time in my life yeah thanks yeah so after you won did people you know obviously that's like huge exposure national television uh you know i don't mm-hmm. know how many viewers they yeah. have but i assume it's in the millions so after you won yeah did people treat you differently did you have strangers coming up to you on the streets and wanting autographs and that sort of thing or yeah how was it for you yeah i mean yeah, it wasn't it wasn't insane. But yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a six foot two guy with one leg who's pretty loud in public. <laughs> so yeah, people, you know, the first year or two, people, would, you know, people would stop and want to do pictures and, you know, an autograph or something like that. And yeah, it was fine. It was cool. Um, but yeah, it was never it was never wild and crazy and overwhelming. It was it was neat. I mean, it's it's cool to have people come up. And, and you know, what was strange, too, was. Because it was reality TV, because, you know, I was eddie on the show and you know they of course i talked about my mom and my dad and my brother and and you know i'd be in an airport in oklahoma and somebody'd be like eddie i don't know if i actually people has you like great and you are <laughs> you know and like, oh i just i just saw you on the show just just wondering how you are and how your family was fantastic man i appreciate it thank you you know um but it's kind of like going to high school with half of you know half of the country because you could be anywhere and so and somebody would grab you and be like, oh, how are things on Long Island? You in New York? You in LA now? Where are you at? You know what's up? And again, I'm like reeling. Really, did I go to college, college with this person? Did I did I did I work with them? Did I, I did I play basketball with or against them? I, I don't know. So that was that was a little that was a little weird in the beginning, but but other than that, it was great. I mean, everybody's been fantastic. You know, then till now, everybody's everybody's great. So I've been yeah. pretty lucky. Pretty lucky. Yeah, you got into an acting career right after this happened. Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, but that's when you really started to get into this pursuit of acting on a very serious level. It seems like, but how did it change your life? That was, is one of the ways. Um, is that correct. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the exposure I got from CBS and Big Brother was fantastic. It was it was great. I mean, it it, it you know it. It gave, I had a bit of a, a look, you know what I'm saying? And uh, so with that, a production company in Toronto contacted me right after I got off the show, saw that I was a broadcasting major with, with aspirations to be an actor and contact, contacted me and said, hey, we saw you, you know, you want to be an actor. We're trying to get this little low budget film off the ground. Would you be interested in coming aboard? So, yeah, I, I'd love to. So I went up to Toronto and I worked on my very first feature film. It was called Drop Dead Roses back in 2001. And I got to do a buddy film with Brian O'Halloran, who was in Clerks and Mall Rats and Chasing Amy, all those Kevin Smith pictures. So him and I did this did this picture together. And, you know, it was, it was fun. We shot in Toronto for like three months in, in the summer in Toronto. It was fantastic. It was great. Came off of that, had some footage. Got some headshots done, did the old mailing of sending out to agents all over New York City. One guy saw me on the show. So I was like, oh, you know what? I liked you. I pulled for you. I called for you once or twice. I'm like, shit, great. Like, why don't you come into the office? So I went into the office and he gave me some sides to read, you know, just to make sure I could read. And uh, I've been with him 18 years now, 19 years now. So, yeah, I've been with the same agent since. Uh, he picked me up. And then from there, he got me, you know, auditions for... Shows like Law and Order and some soaps in the city and a couple of feature films. And so after, you you know, as an actor in New York, once you do Law and Order, like that's the bar. You either stay in New York and become a theater actor or you pack and go to L.A. Hmm. So I was like 26 and packed my car, drove to L.A. and been out there ever since. Hmm. Oh. Wow. Well, yeah. That's yeah, that's amazing. So for people that ha- might not have seen it, so you starred in the Human Race, which 
This is where we met at the Mile High Horror Film Festival in 2012. Yeah. You won the uh, Best Actor yeah. Award uh, for that film, independent, Thank you. independent sci-fi horror. But for people that haven't seen that film, what is that film about and where can people see it? Um, so the human race, yeah, the human race I did with uh, writer director Paul Hoff. Paul Hoff and I had met on a music video that we did with um, Chris Jericho back in 05, maybe. 2005, we did a music video for Chris Jericho. He has this band called Fozzie. So I met Paul Hoff on that, and um, we shot that together. And then right after that, we did a short film called The Angel, which traveled to a bunch of film festivals around the world, which is great. And then we collaborated again uh, for, for The Human Race. Uh, the Human Race uh, was written and directed by Paul Hoff, and it's a fast-paced sci-fi thriller that's um, very much like Battle Royale, if you know Battle Royale. Uh, a lot of you horror fans out there will know. Uh, but yeah, Paul put it all together, and then um, and then yeah, we wound up getting distribution for it, and it's actually out on Amazon right now, I believe. So uh, you can get it there, or um, I think Vimeo has it as well. As well. Uh, and I just did a pilot called Eddie's about uh, about me being a fish out of water owning a beach bar in Venice, which you, which you can also find on video on, on Vimeo on demand, Eddie's. So, hmm. but uh, but yeah, no, everything's cool. I just uh, just I just. I just worked with Jennifer Love Hewitt back in the fall on her show 911. I played a therapist for her over there, and um, worked on Chicago Med last last yeah last summer. So that came out, so that was cool. Just plugging away. Just worked on a just worked on a really good show for Apple TV up in Toronto, which can't talk about just yet. But super excited that should be out in the fall. So yeah, I'm plugging away. Everything's good. Everything's on hold right now, which is tough. So the voiceover stuff that I'm still doing with Paul Hoff. We have a YouTube channel called Don't Turn Around. Uh, and don't turn around dot com. Um, Paul uh, writes these original um, scary stories and I narrate some of them. Some of them are text based uh, text based stories that he does there as well. So it's that's cool. That's keeping us busy in the slow time in Hollywood right now. But uh, just trying to stay sharp. And, you know, uh, there are a lot of a lot of casting offices are doing auditions right now. They're doing cold auditions where they're, they're you know, they're sending out, you know, scenes and scripts. So, so, you know, small sides, if you will, that uh, that people can read for and self tape and then send into the casting offices because catch downtime. They're just looking for and exploring for new talent, which is which is pretty cool, which is pretty neat. So to, at this downtime right now, I think will allow a lot of people who wouldn't normally be able to get into that casting office, uh, you know, see that casting director in that office can now self tape, you know, a, a favorite scene or, or something they want and actually email it and shoot it out, which, you know, they have an increased chance of getting seen now, which is pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. And what what advice would you give to the aspiring actor that wants to get into the industry? Um definitely keep at it. Uh I mean I've been doing this for nineteen years now. Uh yeah, it's definitely you know an overnight success is over a decade. So I mean, it's it's not it's not easy. If it was easy, everybody would do it. Um, but find yourself a good a, a good little group of people. You know, uh, you know, find find a uh, you know a buddy that you believe in who's a good writer. You know, find another acting you know guy or girl or both or whatever who are good you know solid people and solid artists and actors and and you you know it's it's difficult to make it on your own. But if you if you build a good small cluster of of creative friends. Uh, you create together, keep creating, keep creating. And right now it's so, it's so wonderful with the, with the digital, digital age that you can, you can shoot a short and you can shoot a film on your iPhone on your, and you can edit it on your computer. You can do everything in house. Now, you don't, you know, when I started, we had to shoot on 16 millimeter, super 16 and graduated to 35. And, you know, you needed tens of thousands of dollars to shoot a 10 minute short film. I mean, it was ridiculous. Not necessary. Now you can buy a $300 camera camera and 200 300 in sound equipment and have a kick-ass project at the end of the day so um keep chopping at it you know find uh find what you love to do and um uh, you know don't try to be a writer director producer actor and musician pick one maybe two concentrate on those you, you try to spread yourself too thin i don't think you're gonna be able to focus and put all your talent and energy into the field that you will excel at so um, concentrate on, you know, one field at a time and, uh, yeah, put your focus into that and keep at it, keep chopping at it and keep creating and, and just, just have fun with it. And if you're not having fun and it's, it's wearing you down, then then get out and do something else. Uh, be prepared to struggle, be prepared to have good months, good years, bad years. Some days you're eating ramen noodles. Some days you're having mignon and lobster. So 
If you're okay with that, then cool, stick with it. How much, I ask this of most people that I interview that have, that are successful or have done things that are very notable, um, that have overcome the odds. How much do you think of your success, you know, getting on these shows, winning Big Brother, how much of that do you think is right place at the right time versus determination, power of the mind? How much do you think is fate versus your mind or um, right place the right yeah. time or just mere luck? Uh, I think, I think, I think I got lucky on Big Brother. I mean, that I think was a, it was just a luck thing. I mean, it was kind of a shot in the dark. Again, it was a one in 10 chance that anybody can take those chances. Uh, where I am now with my career, which is okay. It's okay. I'm pretty happy with it. I, I attribute that to uh, persistence and preparation. Constantly be sharpening your knives when you're not at war. I mean, you know, always be ready, always be prepared, you know, and, and stay sharp. I try to do that the, like around the tail end of the fall just before the holidays because come January 1, it's pilot season. You want to be on point. So, you know, always be always be working at your craft. Always be prepared and be, be ready for an opportunity when it comes and know that you can pounce on that opportunity and seize it and do your best at it. And sometimes sometimes too all too short uh too fat too skinny my hair's too short i got a beard i don't need a beard i don't have a beard when i should have a beard and i just shaved so all those little factors can't control those but there's a lot that you can control and focus on that and being prepared and being the best at your game that you can be is what you can do so you play wheelchair basketball professionally is that correct yeah yeah i played in the south of france i played in yer H y e r e s years yeah south of France I was just outside of Toulon played for a played for a year out there played pro so I was going uh, I was living in L A and uh, the human race just wrapped up and uh, it was just I just broke up with a girl and was heartbroken and my job sucked and I said man this company this company this team out there had been asking me to come out for a while and I said you know what the hell with it all right cool packed up a duffel bag grabbed my basketball chair jumped a flight I was in the south of France played out there for I don't know eleven months. Felt good. I mean, I lived on the water. It was fantastic. Absolutely. Just traveled all over Europe just playing basketball. Fantastic. It was just great experience. I was 33. 30, yeah, I was 33 years old. It was fantastic. It was so great. So uh, I got to go do that. And then, yeah, I came back to, the, back to the States. I said, okay, let me focus back on my career. You know, they asked me to stay. They said, hey, look, you want to extend your contract and stay? I said, look, I'd love to. This is a fantastic life. But film and television to where my heart is, and I got to get back to L.A. So still keep in touch with all those guys. Still to this day, they still ask me to come back out and play, which is really, really nice and flattering. But uh, but yeah, New York and L.A. is is where film and television is for me, is where my representation is. So I'm here in the States. Yeah. And, and what advice would you give to your 11-year-old self or someone that, you know, has to overcome the odds like you did, that you know, yeah. looking, looking for inspiration? You know, what, what would you tell someone like that? Um, um, so I would just, I would just, you know, I would just say, just keep at it. I mean, a lot of people have let a disability, let them get them down, give them excuse not to leave the house to, to, you know, to, to not take care of themselves. And some people, you know, become disabled and it fires them and it, and, and it makes them aspire to be more and want more. And, uh, I was real lucky for me, you know, being disabled at a young age, I was able to deal with it and cope with it. By the time I was 15, I was just a regular 15 year old kid. Um, but, you know, basketball for me, uh, find an outlet, whether it's writing or or art or music or sports. I mean, for me, it was basketball. Basketball saved my life. Basketball is a fantastic outlet for me. It was great. I mean, I still play to this day. I mean, here it is, you know, 25, 30 years later, I'm still playing and it's it's fantastic. But find that outlet. Find something that, that, that drives you, that makes you get up in the morning and, you know, you know, work hard during the day and something, you know, to camaraderie to, to, you know, to, to find other guys and other, other pe people to, to, to hang with, you know, just, you'll get through it, man. You're not the first, you're not going to be the last. Just, just hang in there, man. You'll be fine. That seems like really, really good advice. Again, that YouTube channel where people can see what you're doing now is don't turn around. Yeah. Is that right? Yep. Don't turn around. Yeah. Don't turn around. Just put a YouTube search. Uh, don't turn around. And then you can just go to don't turn dot com as well. We're trying to get stuff out. We're trying to turn out a lot of content right now, but we're usually getting something out probably at least once a week. We're getting something out, whether it's a new texting video or if it's a narration video that I do. I play a character called 
Warren on a lot of the stuff. One of the big series that we have right now is uh, this series called The Creepy School Bus, which is pretty cool. Paul has absolutely been killing it with this series, so real happy to be a part of that as well. So, But, yeah, don't turn around on YouTube. Okay, and what is The, the Creepy so. School Bus? Creepy School Bus is a series that Paul has created about this, this school bus that goes through this town and abducts kids and takes them to an underground lair, which is... It's a lot of fun. It's it's pretty cool. Our our um our demographic that we're that we're hitting pretty much now is like eight eight to eight to eighteen. So scary stories, you know. Uh, it's it's creepy pasta. So creepy pasta is the world that our channel don't turn around lives in. Um, but yeah, Paul is just fantastic at creating all of this original content, and uh, yeah, I'm just I'm real lucky to be working with him for fifteen plus years now. He's fantastic. So I won't take too much more of your time, but for people that are trying to get they really aspire to get on to reality television what advice would you give to them as far as being able to actually be chosen on the show yeah uh, good question like i said i don't know how i got on my show 20 years ago but uh i my only advice i guess guess would be was be honest be truthful because the bottom line is once those cameras start rolling and they're going to be rolling for more than two days unless you're a phenomenal actor just be yourself because your real stuff will come out. Mm. So just be honest and truthful and you should be okay. And if you don't get picked for the show you want, don't take it as a personal dig, man. It's the, you know, the, the studios, like I said, it's like for every role I go out for. If I get it, I get it. If I don't, it could be stuff out of your control. You're too tall. You look too much like someone else they already cast. I mean, you, if you look too much like the host, they're not going to bring you on. That's just the bottom line, you know? So don't take it personal if, if you're going out for a for a reality show that you really want to be a part of and you never get chosen it's just you know you could be too tall too short hair too long too whatever it's it's something that's out of your control so don't don't take it personally just be honest and truthful with yourself and with the casting department and keep your fingers crossed man so you mentioned earlier that you didn't actually watch the season that you were in no nah. what does that feel like it seems like it'd be a bit odd to constantly be watched by cameras and you know, was that stressful, or did you enjoy that? What does that feel like? Again, I was a 21-year-old kid. I didn't care about anything. You know, the cameras didn't bother me. I mean, there were there were people in the two-way mirrors behind the walls, which didn't seem to hear them, so they weren't a factor. There were cameras in the corners of the walls that you know were on servos. There were like 80 or 90 lav mics hanging from the ceilings, plus the personals we had on us. But I mean, if you constantly think about the fact that every movement every noise everything is being recorded you drive yourself insane so i think i just compartmentalized it and just put it to the back you know uh that that didn't bother me any uh, would it bother me now now at 41 yeah i would probably be a little more cautious and conscious of it uh but at 21 didn't give it sure. didn't care yeah. you know yeah, sure. Is there anything that you wanted to say today that I don't know enough to ask? Mm, can't really think of anything other than you know these you know these times are are pretty crazy right right now that you know I mean we're going through this whole uh, coronavirus lockdown quarantine stuff. Just you know take care of yourselves, take care of your loved ones, and just be smart and be safe out there. And you know just everybody be kind with one another. You know if you can if you can help. I'm out, you know, some elderly people, you know, down the block, go out and do some shopping for them. Great. If somebody's a little low on dough because they're out of out of work and you can spare 20, 30, 40, 50 bucks, just throw it in their mailbox. Don't need to make a big deal of it. Just everybody be cool with each other. You know, good luck. Stay happy. Stay safe. Stay clean and healthy. So when you won the prize, $500,000, how did that change your life? Um, It was... It was it was pretty cool. Uh, you know, CBS cut me a check for five hundred thousand. They said you're responsible for all taxes and you know all financial responsibilities fall on you. I was making like a hundred and three dollars a day in interest, which was just a fun. I mean, being twenty one and waking up in the morning and going, oh, am I going to blow a hundred three dollars today? Was was fun. Um, so then I went and and then after that I threw it all back and didn't touch until just before tax day and I filed for taxes at the last minute, of course, which. They took more than half, which was fine. If I walked out of there with a hundred bucks more than I walked in with, I was happy. 
So uh, from there, I took that money, and um, my my uncle was uh, working with Citibank at the time, and he introduced me to a broker over there. It was fantastic. Took all took a lot of the money and put it into a bunch of mutual funds, and had a real nice diverse portfolio, which was fantastic. It was gonna roll over every six years. Which was cool, and they're like, "Look, you can't touch this money. You can't move. You can't do anything. You're gonna be a, you know, you're gonna be a worker like everyone else. And then you'll have a nice retirement at 50. You know, you'll have a couple of million. So I said, okay, that sounds fine. Oh, I'm okay with that. I'm pretty disciplined, you know. So uh, went ahead and did that, and threw the money in a fantastic uh, portfolio. And a few years went by, and then my father had a massive heart attack. On uh, my father was an elevator repairman in Manhattan. And he uh, he dropped he dropped down of a heart attack in uh, on a building he was working at. And they rushed him off to the hospital. Thank God, knock on wood, he's still here in a pain in my ass today. But uh, it forced him into early retirement from the elevator repair business. Him unable to work, I went ahead, went and saw my broker, cashed in all the chips, and paid off the house. So the house is paid off, and they're okay now. So he's on Social Security with my mom, and they seem to, seem to be uh, you know holding down the fort and doing okay. So I did that's pretty much what I did with my money. So now I'm, you know, flat book and eating ramen noodles, being a struggling actor, and it's fucking great. <laughs> so, well, it seems like you're you're making some big things happen. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I definitely love. We love seeing your work. You mentioned earlier this coronavirus, how it's changing the way that people are, you know, trying to get parts and so forth. How do you think that it's changing the entertainment industry in general? Yeah, I I don't. You know, I don't see the entertainment industry being the same. Maybe never. Uh, I, I I definitely don't see it going back to the way it was for two, maybe three, three years. Um, yeah, I uh, I see. I, I definitely don't see. You know, I think I think Hollywood's kind of optimistic and thinking that cameras are going to be rolling on shows maybe as early as September. I'll be honest with you. I really don't see that happening. I don't. I don't see productions being up and running really, uh, in in a in a full capacity type of deal till after New Year's. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, you have to worry about. You know, if you have, let's say, you know, if, let's say you're dealing with a show like Seinfeld, and you have Jerry Seinfeld, and you know, of course, he's not going to be wearing a mask for the show. But if somebody in crew is sick or, or catering is sick and gets him sick that halts hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of jobs because one guy got sick so you the, you know the, the studios have to be real careful on making sure they don't get their top talent sick because then irreplaceable and you know it's it's it puts so many jobs at risk that um it's it's going to be really 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 strange strange time coming up for them and it's going to be super super slow and and you got to be patient. Just got to be patient. Hang in there. And, um, you know, uh, uh, yeah, it's just, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to, it's going to be real slow in, in, in film and television for a while now. So I read that an article speculating that this, you know, once they open things up again and start shooting, that everyone's going to have to sign these waivers, that they're going to be in close proximity. And, you know, it just seems like sort yeah. of a mess, <laughs> but yeah, I, I definitely see that again. Yeah, the waivers, you know, if you do get sick on our production, possibly from our production, you can't sue us. Yeah, I definitely see that being, you know, definitely a new norm, uh, at least for a few years until, you know, it passes. But uh, I just want to work. I just want to get back to work. I just want to get back to shooting. But, you know, again, in a in a safe environment where I can't get anybody sick and I don't want anybody else to get me sick. So, yeah, I, you know, we'll be patient, you know, but until then, keep creating, keep being mindful of your art and yeah just just uh just you know just stick with it and, and create content you know shoot something with your buddy shoot something with on your phone shoot something with your dog edit it on your on your computer have fun you know just just create stuff just put it out there who cares one person a hundred thousand people see it. who cares just create shoot and just have fun stick with it you'll be fine it, it it will get back sooner or later but it will you know it will get back so so your overall aura if you believe in such a thing your energy is you seem very um inspirational yourself you know i think that you thank you uh, there's so much positivity coming from you and and so it's just really an honor to interview you and i really appreciate your time uh is there of course tim thank you yeah is there anything else that you wanted to say today no just you know again thank you thank you for having me
And uh, I appreciate that. And I'm glad to see that you guys are doing real well out there. And, and you know, to everybody out there watching this, just, you know, stay, stay safe, stay, stay, you know, stay happy and take care of each other and love each other and just be cool. That's it. Just be cool. So that was my interview with Eddie McGee. If you like this video, go ahead and hit the like button and let me know in the comments what you think of this video and who else would you like to see me interview on this channel. I love checking out your comments, so do let me know in the comments. But thank you so much for watching and thank you for your support.